Father, we confess how difficult it is to see our own sin and unworthiness. Pride runs deep in our sinful hearts. The devil works tirelessly to convince us that we're not desperate beggars before you. And the world exalts men and women as their own God in countless ways. Break down our pride with your law. And by your spirit, lead us to humble repentance so that our confidence may be in Christ alone. In his holy and precious name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, what a joy it is, isn't it, to uh, be in the, in the Lord's house, gathered around word and, and sacrament, to be fed and then to be sent forth in, in ministry. It is such a glorious rhythm of life, uh, isn't it? And we started uh, this little eight-week class on justification last week. This is in honor, of course, of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, this is a particularly good year to be Lutheran. <laughs> you, you know, it's just really a good year. And um, so it's uh, going to be a glorious time. And just a little, little glimpse ahead, uh, the uh, month of October we're going to focus on the, the great tenets of the Reformation. Each week I'm going to preach on a different tenet. And then it's going to culminate in, a, in an absolutely glorious Reformation service. Um, you know, one of the advantages of being married to the director of music is, 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 I, is I get sneak peeks. I tell you, this is going to be glorious celebration on, uh, on Reformation Sunday. So it's just a, it's just a wonderful time of, of celebration. We talked about last week what justification is. And remember we talked about the fact that justification is a legal term. It was adopted by the Apostle Paul. It was a legal term used in the day where a judge would declare someone not guilty. Could I ask somebody just to close that back door for me, if you would? Thank you. We need to be justified in order for us to be righteous before God. And God has provided the righteousness. We talked about that last week. Jesus' perfect life uh, of obedience. He suffered and died in our place. He took the punishment that should have fallen upon us. And that righteous act of the Lord Jesus Christ enables God to justify us, to declare us not guilty. We talked about how we can be sure of our justification. The fact that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb, we can indeed be sure that the sacrifice for sin has been uh, accepted. Well, today I want to focus with you on the subject of why do we need to be justified? Why do we need to be justified? Biblical beliefs with regard to sin have fallen increasingly by the wayside in churches and in our society. There is widespread acceptance of the belief that there are no such things as moral absolutes. And you can even hear it in a phrase of this one fellow who said, I don't believe in sin, I believe in choices. I don't believe in sin, I believe in choices, he said. And so today, many believe that something is not sinful if it makes them happy, if it doesn't hurt others, if it's simply common. A couple of years ago in a sermon, remember I, I, I mentioned what, what um, some folks are calling statistical morality where morality is now determined by statistics, that, that you'll sometimes hear X number of people think that this is immoral or, or wrong. And you'll see that uh, many of the things in Scripture where God says, you know, there's, there's only one vote and I'm it. Um, God says, no, this is, this is wrong. People will say, well, the majority of people say it's right. Therefore... It is right. It is statistical morality that the majority will determine right and wrong. We live in a day in which fewer and fewer people are convinced that the Bible is indeed the word of God. And that is in increasingly infecting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
where folks in the churches are unable, as we talked about last week, to discern that which is biblical and that which is not right. This is a really, really serious problem. It's an incredibly serious problem. Because if we, if we believe that sin is not a problem in our lives, then that means that we don't need a savior. Because if sin isn't a problem, what do you need to be saved from? And so as there's an increasing acceptance, even in the churches, of, of a, a, a lessening understanding and definition of sinfulness, that gives rise to no pressing need for a Savior. And if we don't believe in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, then we perish forever. Remember, we are, we are all eternal beings, and we have one of two destinies, either the destiny of heaven or the destiny of hell. So it's a very, very serious, serious problem. We live in a world of justification. And that's the main point that I'd like you to take away from the, from the uh, study this morning. We live in a world of justification. Not God's but humankind's, where humankind declares to itself, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty. And humankind announces unto themselves an absolution if they feel like there is a need for absolution. So I want to take a look with you today about in distinction with, between how Scripture defines justification, how the world defines justification, and how the world attempts to justify themselves. Remember, the undercurrent of, of, of all of our, our classes, um, as we get into, into witnessing based on personality types in, in a couple of months, and, and, and heresies of the old, and, and how you hear them in common language today, and, and how the early church addressed it, how we address it, in, in the tail end of our time together in, in May, when we talk about um, various ways that we can bring comfort and minister to people who are going in difficult times. The undercurrent of everything is witnessing. Remember the premise, we already know enough to witness, right? We already know. You, you know the gospel. You hear it every week. If I say, what's the gospel? You'll be able to articulate that back to me. We know the gospel. We already know enough to be a witness. The undercurrent of all these classes is to further equip us in our articulation, perhaps our confidence of reaching out. But as I shared last week, um, the last thing I want you to take away from is in May of 2018, I'm hitting the streets with the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because then I'll be ready. No, you already are ready. So don't wait until May 2018 when we get done with all this, right? Okay. How is it that the world attempts to justify themselves, to pronounce justification for themselves? One way that we see is to rationalize, is to rationalize. This, of course, goes all the way back to the garden. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 1, please. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verse 29. And we read there, God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Notice what he says in chapter 2, verse 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Hear the rationalization in chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. The rationalization for sin. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, you hear what's happening? And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both were opened. They knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. So here's the rationalization, right? The tree is good for food. They're physical beings. They need to eat. Fruit was pleasing to the eye. How could something that looks good be bad? The fruit was desirable for gaining wisdom. Well, if God was good and would not withhold good from them, if the fruit could make them grow in wisdom, then how could God be against eating it? And what were they doing? They were rationalizing themselves. What were they doing? They were pronouncing upon themselves, because they clearly knew that it was wrong, they were pronouncing upon themselves their justification. They were declaring themselves not guilty. Think on how we can attempt to rationalize our own sins. I'll do it just this once. Everybody does it. My environment and upbringing forces me to do this. No one will know. It won't hurt anybody. I deserve to, to cut loose a little every once in a while. There's too much peer pressure. I'm just a victim. I'm a victim. At least I'm not doing something really bad like others I know. You see, God says this is justification, the declaration of not guilty through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our sinfulness, we have our own justification. And we want to justify ourselves. We want to declare to ourselves the not guilty verdict. So here's reflection. What sins have I been attempting to rationalize. What sins have I been attempting to rationalize? Another way we try and justify ourselves is by denying. By denying. So we will rationalize the okayness with regard to sin. Also, the second is we can be a people that try and deny our sin. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes, please. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, find the book of Psalms right in the middle and then start turning right toward the New Testament, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and then you land in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there we read, This is an evil in all that happens under the sun, that the same fate comes to everyone. Moreover, the hearts of all are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts where they live, and after that they go to the dead. Notice how the heart is described. The hearts are all full of 
evil, madness is in their hearts. Let's go over to the book of Jeremiah. Keep uh, going towards the New Testament. You're going to cross over Isaiah. Then you hit Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? The heart is devious among all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? The sinful human heart by nature denies the actions where God calls sinful things, sinful things. And what comes naturally to us is to trust our own thinking, to determine for ourselves that which is right and wrong. Remember, that goes back to the Garden of Eden, right? God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You do that, you die. Why did he say that? Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of evil. Because the minute we determined, God said, what is right and what is wrong, we die. Because that is reserved unto God. We don't understand the sinfulness of our hearts. We don't understand it. And so we, we, try, and, we try and deny it. Because what we, what we like to hear are and you can fill in whatever motivational speaker will tell you how wonderful you are, you see? Scripture does not say that, does it? Scripture births the honest confession of Paul when he says, Oh, wretched man that I am. We don't understand the evilness of the heart. People will say, why is the world like it is? Why is the world like it is? In fact, one commentator on a show the other day was saying, I believe that in the heart of people, she said, in the heart of people, people are good. I said, wrong. <laughs> wrong. So we're not. Our heart is evil. Is evil. Why is the world like it is? The church has the response to that. Sinfulness. It's our heart. And we want to deny that. We're constantly trying to deny it. But yet scripture reveals to us the truthfulness. This is what's called the doctrine of original sin. We are by nature sinful people. We're unable to be holy. We are oriented toward evil in our thoughts and in our desires. Psalm 51, David says, I was a sinner since my mother, what? Conceived me. Conceived me. You see, it goes all the way back. But there are common misconceptions with regard to the evilness of our, of our heart. You'll hear it in phrases like this. What people need from religion is practical help with life, not the gift of eternal life. Okay, you hear? What's the premise to that? The premise is, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay, you're okay, right? I'm okay, you're okay. What I really need help with are the, the, the struggles I have at work, right? So it becomes psychologized instead of the church dealing with what is the fundamental base problem, and that is the sinfulness and wickedness of our heart. And in our sinfulness, we try and rationalize it. That's how the world justifies. We try and deny it. That's how the world justifies how about this? We have the ability to make a decision to become believers. What does that deny? It denies, as we talk about in the sermon, that we are born blind, enemies, wanting nothing to do with God. We don't have one impulse in us that desires to be in relationship with God. We are born in rebellion against God. 
rationalize, deny. And in denying our sinfulness, we're trying to pronounce justification upon ourselves, to declare ourselves not guilty. Here's the reflection. Have I been in denial about any sin in my life? Have I been in denial about it? About any sin in my life? Here's the third way. We try and justify ourselves by blaming others. We try and justify ourselves. We try and declare ourselves not guilty by blaming others. For the sake of time, I won't turn there, but remember back in Genesis 3 that we uh, talked about last week? Remember what was, what was the response? Who, who, did, who, did, <laughs> who did Eve? <laughs> you're already smiling. You're, you're already ahead of me. Remember they all went like this? Right? Everybody in the scenario, right? It was, it was Eve's fault. It was the serpent's, serpent's fault, you know, and, and, it was, and it was who else's fault? It was God's. Remember the response? You know, the woman you gave me? You know, can you believe it, God? You know, you, you plop me in the garden with her? You know, well, of course we're going to wind up in this situ situation, right? Right? And there it is. It's the blaming of others. So here's the reflection. What sins of my own have I been blaming on others? What sins of my own have I been putting the blame on others? Here's a fourth way. We try and justify ourselves by comparing ourselves with others. We try and justify ourselves by comparing ourselves with others. There's always someone that we know, right, who's sinning more and in worse ways in our mind. Always somebody, right? It's also a lot more easy to focus on somebody else's sinful behavior than our own. And so we look at things and we say, well, at least I'm not like. And then we point the finger, right? Look at Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 48. There we read. Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is. Perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is is perfect. Or over in James, the second chapter, good way to find James, just go to Revelation, turn left. When you start crossing over the, the Peters, slow down. If you hit Hebrews, you're too far. James chapter 2, verse, verse 10 Here we read, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point. God demands from us then perfection. Only if God desired something less than perfection, only if God desired, let's, let's say, for example, decency, then we could perhaps try and justify ourselves, right? How does the world justify? That he, she, they're decent people. But you see, God doesn't establish the criteria of decency. He requires of us absolute holiness. Because of that, we find ourselves as hopeless sinners in need of a Savior. As the church, we need to be a people that lovingly, 
confront with the law as we witness. Because there's never an understanding of a need for a Savior until we understand what we need to be saved from. And that is our sinfulness. So we try and rationalize, we try and deny, we try and blame others, and we try and compare. There's only one right way to be justified. Let's go to Romans, the third chapter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 and following. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. <clears throat> Romans 3, picking up in verse 23. There's no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Why is it all? Because it's a matter of perfection. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, what we've done, what we've left undone. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They're now justified... They're declared not guilty. It's the legal pronouncement. They're now justified by His grace as a gift. Remember, what is, what is grace? It's the undeserved love of God for us. We're now declared not guilty by God's grace. Through the redemption, remember what that word means, it means to buy back. So when Jesus went on the cross, He was, he was buying us back. He's purchasing us through his blood. He sheds his blood because the wrath of God for sinfulness falls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're purchased back. We're bought back through the blood of Christ. By his grace is a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement. Remember, all of the Blood sacrifices, all the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, that was simply a pointing ahead to the one great sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. A sacrifice of what? Of atonement by His blood. You break that word down, that the sacrifice for Christ brought about an at one with God. We're severed from Him because of our sinfulness. We can't spend forever in the presence of a holy God because we are unholy. What we deserve is hell itself. We can't save ourselves. There's no amount of good works that we can do. And contrary to what the world wants, wants to say, we can't justify ourselves. We can't rationalize our sin. We can't deny it. We can't blame any others. And we can't say, well, at least I'm better than them, God, right? Is there a curve here? God says, no, I demand perfection. It's either perfection or failure. And we have all failed. Through the sacrifice of his blood, we are brought back into relationship with him. Then it says, effective through faith. In the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, the world is declared not guilty. And that great victory is received by faith. So if a person comes and says, after we make confession, after the service, or maybe even during the service, and leans over to you and says, wow, that confession was awfully negative. What do you say? Right? Yep. It's truthful. And what it reveals is our need for a Savior. And how glorious and beautiful is that word of absolution. Dealing with our sin by repentance and faith is so wonderfully liberating. Is it not? It is wonderfully liberating liberating. This is bondage, right? If you are, if you are living with, with a sense of 
trying to trying to rationalize your sin, denying the reality of it, blaming others, comparing yourself with others, always trying to justify yourself, always trying to deal with whatever a semblance of guilt might be roving around in your mind from your own perspective of that which is right and wrong. This is just, just bondage. I mean, what a, what a terrible way to live. When we come and we admit our sin freely every single day, when we, when we say, I am a sinner and my heart is wicked and what I deserve is the eternal fire of hell itself, but God in his grace, the judge has said not guilty, through Jesus Christ? That means I can live each and every day in the reality of knowing that when life this side of heaven ends, and remember how the Bible describes it, it's a vapor. When it just vaporizes away, then we are transitioned unto eternal glory. I mean, that's a glorious way to live, is it not? When we, when we say, the meaning that I get out of life is to serve the very one who has declared me not guilty, that means we bring meaning into our relationships. We don't try and get meaning out of our relationships. We bring meaning to our jobs. We don't try and get our meaning for our existence out of our jobs. As I, as I talk about in the sermon, so if you haven't, haven't been there yet, act, act surprised, right? When I get, when I get to the point and, and I say, we can't go higher than the position we have as a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You can't go higher than that. I mean, how liberating is this? We don't have anything to prove. We don't have to tell ourselves how wonderful we are. We say how wonderful a God is that claimed me and is in the process by his grace of making me more and more like Jesus Christ each and every day. It's wonderfully liberating to say, I am a sinner in need of the grace of God and God has provided that grace for me in the Lord Jesus Christ and we live in that grace, this bondage. God says, live in the freedom of the justification that I have given to you. And so we gather on the Lord's day. We receive word and sacrament. We minister to one another. And we're sent forth as that justified people with the greatest message that can ever be shared with someone.